This is a TEDx Media House production. Um, Tinate, thank you so much for finding the time to do this. I know it took a while to pin me down, but thank you so much. Literally. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> it's been weeks. All right, so let's dive into it. Um, I would like to begin by talking about gender and how it's affecting women on the ground. Um, not how gender is affecting women, but the intersections of COVID and gender, how it's affecting women on the ground. Uh, I would be correct to say you identify as a feminist, right? Because um, I know some right. people, they, you say that and they, they, they bug out. I don't. Um, no, please. Please call me a feminist. <laughs> absolutely. I'm here for it. So um, if, let's talk about like the feminist analysis of how COVID-19 and gender are, are intersecting and working on the ground just right now in Zim. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's so much to talk about, there's so much to cover, so when I actually answer your question, I don't even know what to start with, but, you know, um, injustice is a multifaceted thing, you know, it doesn't happen just once, and one injustice will usually lead to another injustice, so we have the, like, basic injustices, which are, while they're affecting women, they're affecting everybody else, but women are just on the front line, because, like, everything else, every disadvantaged group is at the front line of you know, conflict and disaster. But then we also then have like a second tier to like how COVID is affecting gender in that things that are specifically only and really, really affecting um, women during this time. So I think we can really divide it and we can start with the things that are affecting everybody, but mostly affecting women. And I think the first thing has been just um, the reduced mobility. I think anybody who is traveling within Harare right now or Zimbabwe, I'm not sure about the other towns because you know I'm here. Um, there has been roadblocks everywhere, and um, we have encountered. When I say we, I'm talking about my workplace. Um, I work for um, a nonprofit that um, tackles access to justice for women. It's called Zimbabwe Women Lawyers Association. So. Um, the first thing with the reduced mobility is women are really struggling to access um, their sexual health reproductive rights. So for example, there's so many women that cannot get their contraceptives right now because it's, you get to the roadblock, no, I'm going to the clinic, uh, that's not essential, go back. But how do you know what is essential? You don't even have a uterus. Like, but outside of that, like, it's just um, clients are not also able to effectively go to the hospital there are a lot of um clients for termination of pre termination of pregnancy lawful termination of pregnancy that need to travel between either the magistrates court or like the public health institutions or that need to go to the police stations and even at the police stations um they now have police officers standing outside the gates kind of like regulating who comes in who comes out so the power to access law enforcement is literally in the hands of whoever has been designated that day to stand at the gate and they get to decide if your if your issue is important enough so it's kind of like okay why are you here no i'm here to um get my like police report for my termination of pregnancy application it's kind of like but you know like do you know what i mean like these um survivors of sexual assault of rape they're like the pregnancy is growing every day but the soldier at the roadblock does not care he does not understand that this is something that you're trying to do something that you're trying to get and outside of that i'm really bad at economics i have to be honest i don't really understand i have a very basic understanding but um, from my understanding, a majority of informal traders, be it cross-border or people that are purchasing involved domestically, are women. And during this lockdown, a lot of informal traders have not been able to go out on the street and sell their products or even um, access town to buy um, the products that they're trying to sell to people at the corner. So a lot of people have really been disadvantaged because also that money, bear in mind women are mostly the breadwinners in Zimbabwe. So that money is now then like this, it's trickling down is and there's no money for school fees, there's no money for food. So it's like, like reduced mobility has affected food insecurity, it has affected 
drop drop dropping out rates out of school even though there are people that are not going to school for the most part um you'd be shocked to know that some people in rural areas actually were going to school yeah oh wow okay <laughs> i actually didn't know that and so you've mentioned the roadblocks you've mentioned the police um how have you seen from like a justice perspective and a legal perspective how have you seen COVID 19 become i i don't want to put words in your mouth because you haven't answered this maybe an excuse or has it become a cover or has COVID 19 how is how is COVID 19 being used um by the police now um against against women but also against anyone in general I think, you know, there's no time for a pandemic, but this pandemic came really at a perfect time for um, the kind of, um, whew, I don't like to use political words, <laughs> for the kind of system governing. Yeah, the, the system, the governing that is going on in Zimbabwe, it's really come at a perfect time because you see that while the roadblocks had initially come up to regulate um numbers of people going into the cbd and just like large gatherings of people it has now been used to um keep people that are seen to be a threat to um the political order of things out of the cbd because in the cbd is when you can make the most effect if you want to protest if you have something you're unhappy with if there's something you want to report you do it where you do it in the cbd the high court is in the cbd the constitutional court is in the cbd the supreme court is in the cbd parliament is in the cbd um ministry of works it's in the cbd if there's anything that you want to do to fight the system you have to do it in the cbd and as it is people cannot go into the city center and it's kind of like at first it was about covid but suddenly it's not about that because if we needed one letter to just show that i'm an essential service but now all of a sudden you need an id you need this and that you need the approval of the ministry of information it um it just really goes to show that there are a lot of ulterior motives um that are being exercised by the higher powers right and what what gaps like what what opportunities are there as a as, as an organization um like for example like you said you do work for Zimbabwe women's lawyers association is that what it's called yeah um what well, what challenges have you faced and and how, how how are you dealing with them challenges that have been exacerbated by the pandemic for you to provide the services that you provide well it's honestly been a real disaster i don't want to put it lightly at all it's a nightmare it is just a festival of misery so what the pandemic has done is essentially just bring out all of the weak links in the justice system which as like legal practitioners as people in the cso like sector we had already seen these um these little obstacles to access to justice, but now it's so much worse because when people don't have, mobility is such an important thing and I'm actually seeing it now because now it's, you already have the factors that are impeding justice, but on top of that, you have the mobility. So, you know, it's one thing that, it's one thing that the police, police um, law enforcement right now, they are only making arrests on rape and robbery, right? It's, it's bad enough that they're doing that, but they have also released over 6,000 prisoners since the beginning of lockdown. So we have a situation where there are a lot of criminals that are not being put in jail, but there's also a lot of criminals being put out. And while I'm not too concerned about the robberies, I am very concerned about the people that are incarcerated that were incarcerated for committing sexual offenses because as you know repeat offenders are the most offenders so it's at a time you're not arresting people while you're not arresting people you're like it's fine let's take people out of jail and at that same time um currently at rotten Road criminal court most people are going out on bail they don't want to put anyone into prison because they're afraid that if someone might have covid 19 they're going to take it from outside now they're going to put it in jail um, which is already overcrowded. They don't they don't have enough state resources to handle what is going on in the Zim prisons. So now they're trying to keep everyone out of the prisons. But to me, it's just kind of like at what cost? Mm. Right. Yeah. 
because even prosecutions are going a lot slower. So imagine you have all of these domestic violence cases, you have sexual assault matters, you have like grievous bodily harm, you have um, sexual intercourse with a minor. These are all like sexual offenses listed in the criminal code. And people are going to Rotten Row, standing outside. It's literally a bunch of people standing outside Court 6. Court 6 is the one that deals with bail at Rotten Row Criminal Court. And they just call them inside, what is your offense? okay, please go and pay 300 RTGS, which is $3, and go home because things are overcrowded. There's no way we're going to be able to keep someone in the prison right now. Um, in all the matters I've dealt with, only one person has been kept in, like, inside the prison. Yeah. So what That's is interesting, lot. you know, you've mentioned that they, they, they're slowing down on these cases, like, you know, uh, domestic cases and robberies and ETC. Yeah. But uh, there seems to be a speeding up of certain political cases, right? How do we how do we how do we handle that? How do we how how can one look at that, and and sort of is it is it just as simple as saying look that's just how the system works, or are there other risks to it to those that are outside? You know just it just seems like it doesn't doesn't make sense to me that you you know you will slow down cases of of, of abuse of violence robbery even etc bodily yeah. harm but speed up cases of holding placards tweets etc um yeah 100 percent. yeah so how 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 do you how do you look at that and also uh, uh, you know uh, a feminist analysis thinking about how people are being arrested and i mean i know that for physical for physical violence of being beaten up men can be disproportionately disproportionately affected but once it's women it goes to a sexual type of violence um yeah yeah so i don't know how 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 do you look at that and in your in your field and see that yeah well the first thing is what you just said about um the violence and everyone is affected by violence but somehow when it's women the violence is completely different because rape has just been used as this political tool it's something that is completely normalized we had it you know um in the first chimbringa we had it in the second chimbringa we had it in the 2000s we had it in 2008 we had it in 2017 we had it last year and we have it now so it seems like any time that someone who is seen to be against the state um, needs to be punished. If it's a man, okay, they're going to be kidnapped and beaten. They're going to be put in jail. But if it's a woman, it's like rape, rape. They're just, they're just going to be raped. And that's, that's really mind blowing. And it's also extremely mind blowing. That is something that has become um, so normal Right. that we are outraged um, in the first couple of days and then we kind of move on. It's not really that people have moved on, but I think that there's a hopelessness that comes with it that like, what are we supposed to do? So I think it's difficult to challenge a system when the system is telling you we don't have resources. So no matter what you do, no matter what avenue you take to try to navigate through all the problematic little factors that are impeding on justice for women and impeding for justice for um, these complainants and sexual matters, it's kind of like at the end of the road, whichever avenue you take, it's government ain't not mighty. You know, <laughs> government ain't not mighty. Yeah. You see, um, if for example, you have a lot of complainants and sexual assault cases and rape matters, sexual offenses, then you say sexual offenses, they are, for example, forced to live with the perpetrator of the crime within their home, because as you know, most perpetrators of sexual crimes, sexual offenses are within the community, within, within the family. And I, um, I was recently conducting court monitoring, which was um, basically research into statistics around um, convictions in sexual matters and where the um, processes are cumbersome for those complainants, right? And many complainants are just going home with, like you get raped by your brother, you get raped by your father, raped by a family friend, and that person still stays in the house. You're sleeping in the bedroom, and you know that this is the person who's doing this to me. This is, this is the person who did this, but 
you go to social welfare, they'll tell you our homes are maxed out. We don't have any way that we can put this complainant. You go to Msasa Project, and while um, Msasa Project is great, they're fantastic, they offer psychosocial support, and they are also one of the only um, organizations offering safe housing in Zimbabwe. But during COVID, um, they've had a lot of restrictions, especially in the Harare area. Um, we did manage to get someone like, I think it was in Matebele land, into um, a Msasa Project house. But here in Harare, it's been very hectic and they're saying, no, we can't be taking someone in because we have all of these women and some of these women have their children here. So for you to now come here and you might have COVID and then you go to government and government is like, well, we don't have any way to put them. So now where do they go? They just go home. And that is, it's almost like that's just the way things are. You don't, it's not even something that you have to, you don't have to talk about it too much. You know, you have a client, you talk to them, you're like, they know that they're going home after this. You know, they're going home after this. And it's really sad. Yeah. So basically yeah. it's, it's kind of like, even for services that already were non-existent or that were already limited, the lockdown situation and COVID has just even made that worse that people can't get yeah. safe housing and, they, and they're not arresting the perpetrators. So it's kind of like, I feel like some people might feel that there is no need for them to actually report because there is no, yeah. you know, there is, there's nothing that's going to happen. You know, they're not going to a safe house. And then yeah. there's also the, the, the perpetrator yeah. is not going to be arrested as well. Uh, 100%. Um, um, yeah. Think of it this way, um, just to add on protection orders, for example, they have to be applied for at the magistrate's court, um, Corona, Third, and Kwame Nkrumah, and you cannot do that remotely. If you want to apply for a protection order, you have to go to the magistrate's of a court. But if you live in Mabuku Tafara, and there are soldiers and army forces, by the highway telling you you cannot go to town. It means you cannot get that protection order, right? But you know what, it's fine. Let's say you get really lucky and you get to go through the roadblock, you get to magistrate civil court and you can make your protection order. There is currently a lockdown. The person you are trying to get a protection order from lives in your one bedroom house, right? And this is the reality, the authentic reality of most Zimbabwean women right because most people do not have water they don't have internet they don't have electricity and they don't have access to police that are going to say oh statement that is not what is happening in Mapuku Tafara I just really not to obviously like I don't want to use anyone as like I'm not saying the efforts are any less but I think a great testament to it is Tisidangarembwa protesting and taking selfies in a police station make it make sense to me because i promise you there is no one who is in hope who has ever been arrested and been allowed to keep their phone been allowed to put a hashtag on the internet that is what we call privilege and that is just not the reality of most women so even after you get to magistrate civil court and you get to make a protection order it's kind of like okay but who not end up like where do you where do you want him to go? And that's what they're going to ask you. And in the end, you're now sitting at home with this person who knows that you got a protection order from them in like imminent danger, more than you might have been even before you tried to get access to justice. Right. You've brought up something quite important here, which is the intersection of class and, and gender, right? Which is when we talk about women, you know, we want to say, but it's, it's not necessarily all women that are going through specific kinds of oppression and that are lacking specific opportunities, that are lacking specific privileges. Um, mm -hmm. For a lot of people, it's exacerbated by class. For a lot of people, it's exacerbated by, you know, where they live, where they're from, the language they speak, ETC. And, and that's something I think that's very important to note. And then also surveillance. Um, I was thinking about the case of the young girl who through a whatsapp group said something uh she was later arrested uh in kariba i think um and and you know for for saying something against the government or etc and things like that and i think it's just becoming more and more scary how there are fewer safe spaces for women we've always known women are not safe on the internet but the fact that you're not safe in a WhatsApp group now, 
as well, um, which sort of reminds me of the article you wrote about being a woman in a police state, which I will put in the show notes, the link to the article, um, being a woman in a police state in Zimbabwe. Could you go more into that analysis and just ex- sort of explain to our audience, right? Like your perspective and how you're thinking through this. Okay, so I wrote that article for African Feminism and I think I wrote it a couple of days after the MDC uh, women leaders were found and when their prosecution started. Um, I hope that people that are listening to this would know about that. (laughs) For those that are listening and do not know, (laughs) what had happened was. (laughs) What had happened was that um, the government of Zimbabwe promised that following the COVID-19 lockdown, they would be providing some kind of aid or some kind of funds to people in high density areas, especially to tackle food insecurity which as you may know has also caused a rapid increase of child marriage in remote rural Zimbabwe over the last four months. So what happened was MDC criticized the ruling party to say you have not provided this aid and where we are from, where we are, with the people that we are talking to, the people that we are seeing, the youth, the the workers, people are starving. So we are going to go out and protest. So people went out to protest. And as a result, they were, I don't want to say they were arrested because arrest is a lawful thing that happens following committing a crime. So they were abducted. Um, We did not know where they were. And I think they came back after what, 48, 72 hours with reports of having been sexually, yeah. Uh, With reports of having been sexually assaulted having been interrogated, having been verbally abused, psychologically abused, thrown in a ditch, they were literally found on the side of the road. And the reason I wrote that article was not only to report what had happened to these women, but just to identify a pattern within the system. And to be completely honest with you, I'm not going to say that this is a ZANU PF versus MDC thing because both parties are equally guilty for the violation of women's bodies with no accountability or transparency about how to fix the situation or how to move forward or how their policies are going to better include gender equality and fix disparities, you know, in Zimbabwe. So I just wanted to address (laughs) literally Um, If you read the article, you will see I talk a lot about survivors of sexual assault and rape in the past, including um, Justina Mukoko, um, women that were abducted by soldiers in the first Chimurenga and used as, I don't want to say, they call them wives of sorts, but what it was is they would just take women off the street and keep them in their houses to do their laundry, cook for them and rape them. And for them, it was kind of like, no, this is the spoils of what it means to fight for your country. So we're coming way back from that. It's not just opposition doing these things. It's also people that are, you know, um, there's a book by one of the one of the women who was a soldier in the first Chimurenga, and she talks about how they used to be woken up at 2 a.m every time that the leaders got there, like Josiah Tungugara, when Josiah Tungugara would get to the base, they would literally go and wake up the young women and be like, it is your time to go and perform your duty. So imagine fighting for your country equally as your male counterpart and risking your life equally, risking your body equally, but at 2 a.m. you are woken up and you are violated and you are raped against your will. And in the morning, you are still expected to wake up and operate at maximum capacity to free your country So, uh, reconciling it in my head doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. I regurgitate it because that is what happened. But even as I say it, it doesn't matter how many times I explain it, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me that every time there's a political dispute, a woman has to disappear, a woman is raped. It doesn't make sense to me that um, there's a national shutdown and in response to that, army forces invade women's homes, they wreck their residential properties and they rape them. What is the purpose? What is the, what is the purpose of going to Mabuku Tafara, Kunovura my Brendon door to rape my Brendon? 
Monorasa Mapoto Abo, what does that have to do with the national agenda? What does that have to do with being a better Zimbabwe? What does that have to do with freeing all of us, either socially, economically, and whatever political disputes there are, it just seems like the cost is always the body of a woman. And as you may or may not know, Zimbabwe does not have a special protocol for dealing with sexual offenses when they are committed by army or political fo or police forces, which is something that is very important because obviously army forces and police officers have a certain rapport amongst them that makes it really impossible for someone to, well, you know what, that's a male privilege thing to be fair, but it makes it impossible for prosecution or even for a police investigation to be carried out so as it stands all of the all of the women that were raped last year the year before that in 2017 and 2008 and 2005 2008 nothing has been done those are the same soldiers that are still at the roadblocks that are still terrorizing more women those are still the same soldiers that are nyama pande telling women you sit here i'm going to rape you at the end of the day because you are light-skinned and you're beautiful that is the kind of Oof, that is, and those things, you know, you don't wake up today with rape culture. You know, it's like, it's okay yesterday, and it was okay the day before that. It was okay in 1960, and it was okay in 1940, and it was okay in the 1600s. That's why it's okay today, because nothing is an island, and everything is connected. So what COVID has done is, it has just been like, reveal after reveal after reveal of things we already knew, but just a slap in the face of how like detrimental those things are, you know? And while we can sit here actually, and we get to sit here and document these experiences, we get to sit here and talk about it. But the woman, they are never going to have an opportunity to come here and tell the world what they're going through. Yeah. I wanted to say that one thing that you mentioned that's actually very important is the fact that this, when we talk about something being political, especially in Zimbabwean context, we're not just talking about a ruling party. We're talking about an yeah. entire political culture. And yeah. I'll probably get flagged for saying this, but, you know, if Nelson can say, if ED wins, I'm going to give her my sister. And we, when we say, oh, that's just banter. That's stuff that's been said for years. You know, if yeah. he can grab the mic from his wife and say, that's enough, you've spoken enough. And we just yeah. watch and say, I, he was kidding, he was joking. That's actually, that's, that's all part of the pyramid, the complex pyramid that is rape culture. Yeah. Such that yeah. when, it, when yeah. it's now happening under lockdown, when, like you said, somehow they managed to link curfews with soldiers going into people's homes and raping women, it, 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 it doesn't seem like that much of a jump from something that's yeah. just, you know. Um, yeah. And also what I find interesting is that when we talk about this violence and political violence, what is publicized is the physical violence, right? Which, like we said, disproportionately affects men because they are beaten up. That's the violence that we can sort of yeah. see. That is also yeah. not necessarily personal in a way. Um, you know, yeah. it is personal in the sense that, of course, it's that man being beaten up. But you know, yeah. they're, they're beaten up, they're abducted and stuff. We see that, we tweet, we hashtag. We don't actually yeah. get to hear about the home invasions, which I know are true because I also used to work for an NGO that actually dealt. I used uh, I interned for yeah. his mother trust and they dealt with victims of political violence. Okay. And I know yeah. that happened, right? So you'd be on the phone with people that tell you that this happened to me yesterday. You don't, you don't yeah. see hashtags about that. You don't see much discussion about yeah. that. So yeah. for some reason, the sort of, violation that happens to women is is, is somewhat is, is very personal but also not very personal because it is about politics it has been spurred on by politics yeah. happens to you personally yeah. Yeah. you sort of suffer alone nobody actually stands in solidarity with you it's not yeah 100 yeah. um which is sad but that's yeah. actually all i had to ask you today do you have anything else that you really wish i had asked you that you want to address um yes <laughs> let's go let's hear it <laughs> <laughs> okay i really wanted to address um the increase of child marriages 
like I was saying, nothing is an island. Everything is caused by something. And you know, the patriarchy is so intricately woven into our system. Sometimes you can miss it, but it's also so intricately woven in our system. Sometimes you see it in yourself. You don't just see it in other people. Mm-hmm. And, and what I'm seeing is everything seems to be trickling down to the youngest people in the society. So we have people staying in the house, which is causing um, higher rates of food insecurity. Um, higher rates of food insecurity, right? Um, we have Binga, we have Chimani Mani, we have um, Epworth, we have Hopish Chimiza. Those are some of the places that are pretty high up with those things. And what is now happening is you will have these um, households that have young girls in them and people have not eaten for four days. You know, um, Tadiwa, Tindai, Sarah, they just turned eight, nine. There is um, people here call them Korokoza gold panners who is saying, look, um, I can give you 50 United States dollars. And if police officers are earning $20 a month, you can only imagine what 50 United States dollars is to someone who is living in rural Zimbabwe. That could probably take them through, honestly, months and months. months. And they're saying, why don't I give you 50 United States dollars and you just let me Let me just take one of your children off your hands. And now what is happening is this child has been taken out of this home where they are food insecure. And now they are going into this house where where they are going to be raped every day by this person. And you cannot tell me that someone who is marrying a nine-year-old, eight-year-old is going to treat that person better when they become 18 years old. No, we have now officially created a cycle. So now five, 10 years later, child marriage this is now my client or the woman who's talking to me about being in an abusive relationship and not having anywhere to go and so forth and so forth and so forth and the child marriage continues which is a very big advocacy point for me in my work for those that are going to check it out i am a very big advocate against child marriage um one in currently in Mashana land, about 50% of girls are married off before the age of 18. Yes, 50%. 50%. Yes, I said 50%. For those of you that are clean, cleaning their ears, I said 50%. Um, so it's, it's really bad. Yeah. Um, I don't want to imagine what it's like. I only... To even speak, I have never had the privilege myself to speak to um, someone who is nine years old, 10 years old, who has been married off. But I have had, you know, the chance to speak to people that are 15, 18, 20, that are telling you, no, this guy when I was 11 years old. And you see the effects of that and they are close to irreversible because those are the same women that we do not have capacity to put in social welfare those are the right. same women that are being told by Sasa project no we're not currently taking people because of the COVID-19 it just it's just it's just a lot and you know this pandemic has been really hard for women and it has been such like an eye-opener and I wish that there was more we could do but we are also at a point where even civil society organizations in Zimbabwe sometimes you are just at a loss. You don't know what you can do because there are certain programs, certain implementations that need government support, that need state to be functioning well. And if we are in a stateless, stateless place, how can we, how can we do anything? Yeah, okay, I think that's it. No, it's actually, it's such a really good point. The one thing as well that you mentioned is, you know, that food, food insecurity. And for a lot of young kids uh, that when schools use, some schools, especially in rural areas, provide food for kids. And with the lockdown and the shutdown, um, they are, you know, that, that, in, that makes them even more food insecure. Because it used to be yeah. that, you know, a kid could go to school and then they would get whatever they're getting. Uh, boy, yeah. or whatever for lunch. That would at least sell yeah. one person, right? Yeah. And so... You're absolutely right that the pandemic has worsened things. But uh, thank you so much for bringing that up. And we'll put links to, to, to your work and, and your organizations as well in the show notes. 
what I'll do now is I'll ask you three rapid fire questions. You say whatever comes to your mind first, uh, and that, that'll be it. You ready? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're lucky that they're the same. So you've already listened to an episode, so they're the same for everybody. Okay. So, okay, I'm ready. Um, what is the one thing in your routine that has changed as a result of the pandemic? My working hours. I find myself working at 2 a.m. and sleeping at 1 p.m. sometimes if I'm working from home. Because okay. time is a social right. construct. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Um, and imagining that things open back up normally, what is the first place you'll go to or the first activity that you would do? In a, perfect a personal thing or a professional thing? Personal thing. A personal thing, the first thing I would like to do is go to Botanical Gardens. I really love that place and I haven't been there in four months. But professionally, there are a lot of programs that I'm trying to implement in sick and rural that I have not been able to access. I haven't even been able to go there. I haven't been able to speak to like the rural leaders or the headmasters or anyone from the ministry because of all of this. And I'm trying to do this for the kids. So free me so I can get to the kids. Like <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Um, I'd like to hear more about those projects later though, actually. And so the last thing, would be what is the one thing that you would like the world to keep or that you that you would personally like to keep um, once all of this is over? I would like to keep the fact that people can work from home and we don't have to do things in person if we can do them over the phone. That is so nice. True. That is really, really nice because you actually don't need to go to the office five days a week. And you don't need to be at the office for seven, 12 hours a day to make things work. You can be sitting in your house, be extremely comfortable, be at peace in your mental health and still get things done. That's right. All right. Thank you so much, Nazi. This was an absolutely great interview. I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Yes. I appreciate you. Thank you.